Hello, everyone. On behalf of CAI and the Great IT Professional, we'd like to welcome you today to this webinar on scaling agile development. This webinar has been developed by Christoph Ebert, and my name is Wendy Nolan. I'm the host for CAI's Great IT Professional Educational Program. You will be able to hear Christoph and myself as panelists, but the other audio lines have been muted. Christoph Ebert is Managing Director at Vector Consulting Services. He supports clients around the world to improve product strategy and product development and to manage organizational changes. Dr. Ebert is a professor at University of Stugger and Sorbane, Sorbane at Paris. Dr. Ebert, thanks so much for joining us today. Would you like to tell us more about the Vector Group and Vector Consulting Services? Sure, and uh, welcome to everybody to this webinar. Uh, very briefly about Vector, we are one of those hidden champions, uh, which are typically not so much visible, about uh, 3,000 uh, people worldwide uh, active in different disciplines, primarily automotive, but generally in critical industries. And I'm responsible for the consulting activities of Vector, which uh, has one branch, which is uh, transformation, is exactly the topic of today. Other topics is trust, uh, technology, and also trainings. Now, from a perspective of uh, transformation, I will have uh, experiences on uh, industry project of agile and scaling agile, especially in critical topics like um, high safety risks, high uh, information security risks, big distributed projects. And so I'm very in looking forward to this uh, webinar with you. Great, thank you so much. Our webinar today is brought to you and sponsored by CAI. CAI specializes in the software development and maintenance side of technology with an emphasis on delivering projects on time, on budget, and at 25% less cost. We're intellectual leaders in our field with over 4,000 associates and 35 years of experience. As such, we're committed to helping to teach the IT community about the art and science of technology management. And to facilitate this knowledge transfer, we created the Great IT Professional as a platform for sharing and teaching within the IT community. We've produced over 1,000 hours of educational content, all of which you can access today at greatpro.org. We have a mobile app that you can download at greatpro.org slash mobile. We understand that as a fellow IT professional, your personal knowledge growth is critical for your career success and earning capacity, and to that end, CAI is proud to be partner with you on your journey of continuous learning and development. So thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And, Christoph, once again, thanks for being here. I will turn it over to you for the presentation. Thank you. And uh, let us get started. And uh, I think a key starting point is always to see what are the major trends which we currently have because they impact our challenges in industry but also the way how we want to behave and a key trend which we see this year in uh, 2020 is that uh, uh, with uh, the um, COVID pandemic, but also with other challenges which started already in 2019, is a very strong short-term challenge. Uh, this is the horizontal axis on uh, cost and efficiency. Now, what it means is, is a huge pressure on competitiveness, uh, specifically on, uh, on cost. Uh, and at the same time, especially in uh, critical industries, but also across other uh, industries. Uh, quality matters. This is also an important short-term challenge. And we still face the situation of uh, not enough competences. Why? Because in the past years, competences were scarce, and therefore also knowledge was scarce. And uh, this together uh, brought exactly the situation that at the moment, while we have to uh, compete on cost and quality, with insufficient competences, that leads us in a vicious circle of cost pressure, lack of competences, less in so innovation, and you need more rework. And that is exactly the risk which we currently see across many of our clients worldwide. Now, the second risk is what we see in the middle. All the interesting topics are considered not so much a short-term challenge, but a long-term challenge. Now, this is obvious because people have to give an order or priority to the answers when we ask them because they can only give 
uh, five answers to these questions, and so obviously they have to make some ranking. And that means what we can also see in the slide is a current uh, situation, there is not enough energy for innovation. And I'm not talking about uh, the uh, five, six very big players uh, in IT, which they have enough uh, guts uh, to do a lot of uh, good innovation, but uh, we look here more on the situation of, uh, let's say, uh, companies of different size, which are in this uh, struggle on uh, cost and efficiency. And for that reason, I think it is very important to be aware of this threat of the vicious circle, because when I later on introduce to HL, then we should always keep in mind the starting point is not that we want to do HL to be HL, but we want to be to do HL because uh, it helps us to stay compet competitive. Now, the the challenge which we see in 2020 specifically, and this comes on top of the previous picture, because it has accelerated a few changes which were around anyway, is what we now call a new normal. A new normal means uh, we have we are past the panic mode uh, with respect to COVID. Uh, we are in a severe downturn depending on the industries. We had a slight recovery in um, early Q Q3, but with Q4 now we see in many parts of the world um, a second wave uh, arriving or some parts even never left the first wave. And this means it is not so obvious how long this time will be. And I'm not going to get now into a, a lecture on the uh, challenges of COVID. The only thing is from a perspective of HL, uh, one important message is that uh, we should not get back into panic mode because that led uh, in the uh, time frame March, April, May, into what we call cowing. Uh, so people were kind of um, staying home, uh, increasingly feel well at home. It's a very dangerous situation. We should never feel well if we don't work. Uh, so we have, even if we work from home office or anywhere on the road, we have to stay energetic and uh, not uh, in this panic slow down mode. And at the same time, uh, we have now learned what it means uh, to deal with uh, COVID. And that means, um, this is why we call it, it's a new normal. Many of my clients uh, these days work just normally in, in this new environment. So they have less people in the office. They have more people work remotely, especially for IT. And it's not a big deal. We've been doing that for uh, two decades. It's not just a bigger pressure. We don't fly. We don't uh, make big business trips. But in fact, what we realize is, and this is the benefit from uh, COVID, uh, productivity is increasing if we do it well because we have less friction time, we have less um, overheads with traveling. I have sometimes on one day uh, five, six customer meetings, which take one or two hours. Uh, sometimes I make reviews already in the early morning with Australia. Uh, with the time zone difference, uh, that means uh, for them it's already the afternoon. Sometimes I work in the afternoon or in the evening with U.S. And um, that means these are things which in the past we thought are never possible. This is agility. This means that we adjust uh, to the constraints which we have and that we reduce waste. Travel time was always waste. And uh, this is uh, one of the five basic agile uh, elements that we uh, reduce waste, we reduce friction. That's the second one. We focus on value. This is agile in a nutshell. And this is exactly what this presentation will be about, but also why I think it is important to realize that the current situation, though it is certainly not the one which we would uh, like to have in 2020 and 21, we should also get adjusted towards understanding it's uh, it's a new normal. We have no idea really what uh, next year will bring. It's, uh, as we say, VUCA, uh, that means uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ubiquitous. And this is uh, what our future will be, and uh, that means the new normal, and this is the key message here, the new normal with COVID and after COVID is HL. It's even more HL than ever. Now, a second very important trend is that we have a severe change also in the way we address technology. I put that into four words, which together give the abbreviation ACES, because each one is an ACE. It helps us to move forward. 
Autonomy is what we see now in many industries, uh, for instance, um, in medical. We see now a lot of um, treatment, not only the analysis, but also the treatment uh, being done by uh, machine learning systems, which um, uh, look to the results from um, <clears throat> MRT, from uh, CT, from other uh, analysis uh, in order to find out what could be a, a root cause of some health issues. Uh, we have that, of course, in mobility. We have autonomous vehicles, we have uh, autonom autonomous drones. Increasingly, we have a lot of robots. Uh, autonomy, I think, is fairly easy to grasp. If you look to the banking and finance sector, uh, where I've recently done um, a big project, uh, we have already uh, a majority in many banks of all the workflows handled um, uh, autonomously. It's not only credit card, um, that is a famous one, but it's um, many uh, processes are done either fully autonomous or with bots, which allow interaction with the user. Second big trend is connectivity. This is, of course, a condition because our world is connected uh, anyway, but the, connecti uh, the connectivity is growing. We not only connect obvious, uh, let's say, uh, devices, like we connect a PC with the Wi-Fi, but we also connect uh, our many gadgets which we have, um, our maybe medical implants, uh, if some have one, our uh, different um, mobility services, all these things connect, know what we want to do, help us. And uh, from old uh, topic of intelligent home and um, uh, Internet of Things, we get now into a seamless connectivity. So we don't even anymore have to think in the future so much how would they connect, but rather what are the services which we run on which part uh, from an IT perspective. The third one is technology. It's a very big trend uh, which has started um, a while ago, but it's now very much uh, enforced both um, uh, by, uh, for instance, state like California, but also European Union, which have uh, in the meantime rather similar objectives in order to reduce pollution and uh, make devices more ecologic. But that has, of course, also a big impact on IT. That's why we speak about green IT, also a very big trend within the IT. And finally, we have the whole world of services, which uh, mean that uh, we don't anymore think in terms of tangible products, but much more in terms of the lifetime of such a product and how can we maximize the benefits. That all being said, we have a uh, big amount on our business models, which I'm not going to further explore, uh, except uh, that I want to underline the business models are fluid. That means they can be changing, they can be uh, redefined in a what we call smartphone-like uh, approach, which means the hardware can stay there for a while, but all what we put on top in terms of services, in terms of um, the software stack, because of connectivity and also because of autonomy, which means that we have adaptive systems, that's also one form of autonomy, the different IT systems get more and more uh, adaptive and flexible. And that brings us into a, a big topic, which is we have an increasing amount uh, of liability risk. Cybersecurity is one of the famous because it applies to all industries, but there's of course much more. That means at the time when we grow the complexity in terms of all these new services, we also increase the liability, and that means to close uh, this uh, loop of what I explained earlier, why there is such a high focus on quality these days. Even understanding that we have a huge cost pressure, companies have realized if there is a callback of a device, uh, I mean, for instance, uh, there was recently a callback of certain medical devices because of cybersecurity th uh, threats, these things are not uh, of low cost. If you look to automotive industry, the amount of software-driven callback is increasing year by year on a double-digit percentage. This is a lot because uh, callback is money and the money which you uh, lack in your margin. That means we have also a lot of impacts on the engineering, such as how do we handle this convergence of IT systems and embedded systems which are the appropriate service-oriented architecture, new challenges with learning systems and artificial intelligence, such as what would be the safety of the intended functionality. Um, agile innovation, that means uh, smaller steps in multiple players, and maybe the most obvious for all of you, Contenuous X, that means 
development delivery deployment faster and increasingly automated. This is the picture which we have in front of us at the moment. And uh, this is why we speak about ACES because well done means that we have a real uh, big business advantage. Now the challenges of course are also not negligible, which means that we move from traditional environments with um, a few uh, locations, uh, teams, suppliers, uh, systems, engineering disciplines into many locations, fluid, dynamically changing. I have currently big projects uh, which work in uh, three uh, regions of the world. Typically it's India, can be also uh, in addition with uh, China, with Vietnam and others. It's North America, it's Europe, can also be on top of that Australia, this is then already very demanding, or can be other places in, uh, in Asia or in South America. And suddenly we talk about uh, not only four or five time zones, uh, which of course people in America are already used to, but uh, we actually talk about uh, big time zone differences we talk about culture differences, we talk about different mindsets, and certainly the challenge, how do we convey uh, technical uh, decisions and also the underlying uh, knowledge management. Ecosystems are uh, very fast changing and adopting uh, new rules. This is a big uh, challenge in uh, not only business, but also how we drive this business. And Finally, we have, of course, more complex systems. We have uh, higher criticality. I mentioned the challenge with uh, liability. And we have more and more engineering disciplines which uh, participate. While in the old days, you might have had um, a few computer scientists and uh, electrical engineers, you have now many different uh, interaction points. Uh, for instance, if you talk about mobility, you suddenly have not only the engineers, you would have people from natural sciences like uh, chemical engineers, like um, physicists, etc. Um, if, if you speak about new um, powertrain concepts, but at the same time, it's clear that also in other um, products, you have an increasing mix of disciplines. If you go in medical, you have bioengineers, you have medical doctors, of course, which uh, fertilize uh, these products. And you still have the classic EE and IT expertise. That means all that makes the systems critical, the risk high, and that means we have to deal, if we talk about agile, with these risks. Business risk, people, process, and technology. And that means in a nutshell, we need agility on a, on a new level. It's not anymore uh, some agility out of the book, and I will not tell you anything out of the book in this webinar. I'm very blunt here. What I can tell you is just ways to address this complexity. And if somebody wants to sell you an out of the book agile uh, behavior, uh, then you should take away that this is impossible with the challenges I just mentioned. Each agile process which we see with customers, and that means uh, not necessarily uh, supported from our side even, uh, because customers have just set it up one way or the other. Often they started, they used to start with a book or with a course or with some certification and realize after a while it will not scale. It will not work. Even if it's called scaling, uh, it's not possible to anticipate all the different business models and usage schemes in advance and to make a model which um, fits all these different challenges. That means we will also, as a new normal, have much more, um, let's say, challenges with respect to how can we really bring together uh, different disciplines, different um, locations, ecosystems, etc. So this uh, volatility, but also uh, continuously changing fluid business model, that will be a deep, big challenge in the 2020s. Now, HL. As I said, it often appears easy. There are many seminars, there are many books, uh, there are many t tutorials, and they would all speak about things like Scrum, or they would um, speak about um, ownership, they would speak about empowerment. Um, but the dark side is that 30% uh, of the companies with agile targets really um, reach their goals. 
most fail. This is already very important. If you look into the distribution, uh, we can roughly say one quarter of the companies are agile. That's also my perspective. I would say it's a little bit less than a quarter, can be 15 or 20 percent. Another quarter would be startup. This is hopefully by nature agile. So these are the real um, agile companies. Um, another quarter is in a classic bureaucratic mode. And uh, yet another quarter, and this is a, a, the dangerous part in this uh, statistics, is what we call trapped in change. They have not yet found a solution towards implementing HL. Now, I have many such customers because obviously they come to us mostly when they are in number four, uh, trapped in change, or they have started something which wouldn't scale, and they ask, dear Vector, can you help us? And uh, because we uh, didn't mention that, uh, we produce in Vector a lot of uh, software ourselves. And in this software production, we work, of course, with agile processes, uh, with deployment schemes, etc. So we know that what we talk about is possible. Nevertheless, it's also important uh, to realize it's not easy. And this is more often misunderstood. Now, in a nutshell, what it means is that we move from bureaucracy with a lot of um, expensive loops to make changes and no ownership at all into more uh, flexible fluid mode, which is uh, the normal agile, where you see the picture in the middle. But what really gives us an incentive for the future beyond the challenges of competing on uh, cost, quality, and also the, uh, let's say, the communication and uh, cultural topics. This is what we call HR scaling. Uh, ensure each person in the team has the same value focus. Everybody would ask themselves something which I ask myself every evening, which is what have you gotten done today? Uh, focus on the value, focus on what you deliver. Make a plan for the next day what to deliver. This is a basic scrum thinking, but it's rarely really practiced. And this is what we need if we want to scale in big projects, distributed projects, high complexity, that people would not need complex frameworks because the uh, world is anyway unpredictable. What they need is clear roles, deliverables, and a good and strong value focus for each of the team members. Now, this being said, means that if we look into the Agile wheel, which is in the middle with the five Agile drivers, which is empowerment, value orientation, waste reduction, value stream, and continuous improvement, you have heard about those. I mentioned earlier the three uh, which um, we typically focus most, but um, obviously you need number five, continuous improvement anyway. And you can also realize that for our four dimensions, business, people, process, and technology, we can always translate this, let's say, HR wheel into what would it be really meaning business, for instance. What's the meaning of value? Can be speed, can be flexibility, can be ecosystems, can be new supply chain. I mean, it is not God given, but it's important to understand that value has to be translated. It's not, uh, as we say, I put it differently, as we say, value exists in the eyes of the beholder. You cannot simply say, well, this is value. You have to create value. People dimension, I said already a big challenge is the distributed uh, people because now with the new normal, many people work from home. So we are in a distributed mode uh, wherever we look. And that means this has to be mastered. We have global collaboration, so we have big time zone differences. And also here, value-minded culture helps. Technology, we have a lot of new challenges with respect to technology. I mentioned safety and cyber security, but also adaptive service-oriented architectures, legacy evolution, etc. And finally, the process should be efficient in order of our cost reduction targets should be clearly risk-oriented. So when we introduce, for instance, cybersecurity with clients, we always uh, apply 
a risk-oriented cybersecurity. If I do requirements engineering, I do a risk-oriented requirements engineering. It's important that with this uncertainty, volatility, complexity, and ambiguity, that we have a strong point, which is here we can use a certain approach, uh, a certain process, in order to make, mitigate the many risks which we have. And we have governments. This is increasingly relevant because uh, if you're on a liability case, uh, you have to prove that you uh, followed certain rules. I have currently such a situation with a client uh, where they have um, severe de delivery risks and uh, we look to the processes which they apply. And I mean, we we cannot go with, uh, you know, lip service and paperware. We have really to check what is applied and we found that requirements engineering was um, rather insufficient, but also traceability. And uh, so we had to really to spend uh, energy in the short term to make them sufficiently mature to exercise the necessary governance before um, somebody else would tell them that they would not uh, fulfill criteria and then have to pay dearly. So that's in a nutshell what we expect from any scaling in agile in this four dimension of business people, technology and process. Mapping that into the typical HR principles, which is on the left side, like uh, Scrum, Epics, uh, Sprints, etc., means that we have to translate these small elements, these Lego pieces, into processes, requirements engineering, architecture, validation, etc. So we have to identify what to scale, how to scale, and um, what could be an incremental way forward? This is how we typically address transformation projects. And that means also that often customers ask us, so where are we with our HR project? So we have set up an HR um, assessment. It's similar to the classic assessments with the five levels, like CMMI or SPICE. That is um, level one, which means no change really, speaking HR. Level two, doing HR. Level three, behaving HR. Number four, growing HR. Number five, optimizing HR, almost with um, a clear mapping into what does it mean and what would it help us. Now, most companies, as, I'm, as you remember, when we look into the previous numbers, one quarter, newcomers, one quarter, HR, one quarter, more less challenged, and uh, one uh, Water uh, being on a way. That means for those, it's important to understand where are we with agility and um, how can we follow a path which really delivers results. So, in a nutshell, we can scale along uh, the previously seen dimensions of the need for continuity and the need for risk mitigation. And we see that what really matters, matters is what allows us to deal with high flexibility or deliver high flexibility and at the same time deal with high. Uh, risk and therefore the needs for governance. We have made a reference model in Vector only more for our own consulting exercise. We don't sell the model as such, uh, but to uh, conduct HL transformation, <clears throat> which is called ACE, HL for Critical Engineering, which is essentially um, following a W approach that is to have either continuous X, that would be a, a white line, which is rather low, or would have maybe continuity also in the higher levels. But in general, the W is a good role model uh, for implementing agility. There's also an article where we compare different frameworks. If you are interested, it was in um, IEEE Software uh, 2018, and uh, we also have um, some graphics, posters, etc., which we typically use better understand. Now with such checks, we can of course also approach the current uh, major frameworks, like the Scrum of Scrum, the Scale HR framework plus Scale Scrum, Distributed HR Delivery, and HR for Critical Engineering, and uh, we'll realize that none of them is really uh, perfect, and the general message which I also gave in my beginning was 
that with the complexity being high and the cost also being high, it's certainly not something you want to recommend. I've seen people who started with such a framework and uh, companies and after a while really understood this is too much overhead. In other words, don't, uh, as I said earlier, buy the things um, from, uh, let's say, some uh, some uh, channel which promise you that anything will be possible. Rather, try to build from HL pieces like Scrum, like feature development teams, etc. Build your own HL process, which really suits your needs. And this being said, uh, we can, of course, then also understand that uh, such a discipline needs a lot of um, tools, methods, and this is what we can see here. I'm not going to go into all the, these details, but uh, it's clear that uh, we do have, um, even for the major uh, dimension of requirements engineering, architecture, large systems, and safety, cybersecurity, a huge set of goals which we have to process, and that means different artifacts have to be adjusted. It's just not possible to do that in front of a project. And that's why uh, this sharing of the respective methods uh, needs really good understanding, a good tailoring, not just um, you know a model of the shelf. Let me give you an idea how this looks in practice from a benchmark, which we have been doing in um, IT infrastructure. It's, um, starting out with some business needs, that's what we typically address in the beginning, like a uh, faster time to market, a reduction of um, test and integration, um, maybe a risk reduction prior uh, to the market introduction and uh, systematic uh, cross-technology re reuse. These were the inputs which we received from a customer, and they are as colorful as the business world is. So rarely two customers have similar business needs. And if they have, I mean, they might start on a very high level saying, well, I have a cost uh, issue. I have um, a challenge with respect to um, reaction time on, on service requests, etc." Then we still have to lower it in order to really understand what does it mean. Or somebody would simply say, well, my target is to reduce cost. It might be a nice uh, thing to achieve, but uh, you still have to see where do they waste how much. This is one of the HL checkpoints. And how can we create value? Because often I hear from clients, uh, we are too expensive, we have to reduce cost. And then consulting is seen as a cost uh, cut. But what I think is helping much more, what we uh, try at least to discuss with the customer in the beginning is why not increasing the value and therefore you know the, the top line because if you have a higher top line maybe cost matters less because uh, you have still a good margin in other words it's also this perspective change which would help us to really address uh, relevant topics now the scaling needs as i said you take the pieces scrum kanban continuous integration, DevOps, whatsoever, you take the pieces and try to see how do they fit now to these business needs. If you want to accelerate time to market, I should certainly not take one of these complex models because time to market means slim, fast, mean, but at the essence always uh, not much overhead. And we, of course, also need scaling technology like um, how can we best draw an, an architecture, uh, a reuse strategy, etc. Now, the way we introduce it's uh, in this picture here, we're a bit uh, simplified, that we introduced first a continuous integration pipeline, which uh, allowed an internal DevOps, and then we used that to review, revisit uh, architecture decisions, for instance, and uh, system requirements, and that gave us a much better understanding of how can we reduce a scope and therefore cost of a system without losing any uh, traction to the markets. The results in most cases is first of all, as far as a very big result, that we achieve a sustainable HR process. Uh, sustainable means that companies use it after a while. And you might have seen this is not always the case, and that means 
we know that about 30% really are able to change the culture, 70% don't achieve it. A while ago, about 10 years ago, there was like 50-50. 50% of the project who started HR would not reach the goal, 50 reached the goal. Today is a 30-70. It's an increasing amount who don't reach the goals. In other words, the results, of course, depend on the uh, available competences, but also on the processes. Another one would be a result is always to orchestrate teams. I mean, even if the company is small, agile means that everybody push in the same direction. That means uh, we need to uh, tr uh, draw an architecture picture to see how can we now see the uncertainties, dependencies, and consider that in our HR setup. And finally, uh, of course, a lot of uh, tools, instrumentation, as you say, stakeholders in order to capture uh, feedback. Now, a second benchmark which we look into was in the automotive sector. And here again, the situation is, of course, different. Uh, time to market, which used to be in the range of years, is now something which should be only, uh, let's say, two years, maybe faster. It's definitely very globally developed. I mean, if I take companies like GM or like Ford, they work in different uh, parts of the world. And that's okay, but we have to manage it. Highest quality. I mean, a car is safety critical, but also should look nice, etc. So uh, this is also a key uh, topic uh, to consider as a typical business goal. Integration subject tier one, that is now a specific automotive topic because from an OEM perspective, they always have a few A suppliers, which should be part of the upgrade. Now, what were the elements? You see, they are different from the previous one. Avoid effect of failures, concepts and implementation of dependability, continuous migration, uh, integration. So the continuous X is the same, but woven with other challenges. And that gives us also uh, some results, which were sustainable, like a virtual um, distributed team, which keeps commitment. This is, again, like in the previous example, where we said the most important change is sustainable agility. Here, yeah, the most important would be that we can really work on a team with the necessary um, trust globally, but also with the necessary ownership. Reduce rework is a key objective because uh, a rework to the requirement is quite expensive. Faster cycle time to challenge uh, as you move from weeks to uh, days, ensuring safety and security at the same time and integrity with uh, sustainable modeling. That is, uh, as I said earlier, to have models which can be reused later on. A big takeaway from all that was that, if we go to this uh, picture here, that we moved into a delivery orientation with a proven method orientation. What does it mean? HL certainly is delivery oriented, no doubt on that. HL means that we want to deliver a change, a close the ticket, etc. The drawback is often HL is considered as throwing away these old methods. And then suddenly not realizing that we don't have any more method if uh, it was uh, not any more used. In other words, when we look to this picture, delivery and process orientation is exactly this um, upper left segment, but we see somewhere in the middle. And here in the middle is exactly what the people should focus upon in order to have methods and delivery focus. HR transformation, also we learned that uh, we do that since many years, long before um, we have uh, started now with um, this scaling, but the HR transformation means not necessarily that we have uh, now, uh, let's say, um, a ready-to-go system or process suite or management system where we work together in order to apply it. So to summarize um, on the initial findings uh, on which we then can build is that 
Agile scaling is certainly necessary. I gave several reasons because it helps us to cope with the uncertainties. It helps to cope with the need to master complexity. But at the same time, we also see that it has to be scaled to these four dimensions of business people, technology, and process. Uh, recipe style approach is not recommended because when we look from an industry perspective, uh, we, we hardly have really uh, precise uh, uh, frameworks which tell us these are the things to do. Mostly they are just complex and uh, rather than tailing a complex framework is much easier to use base elements from any of these uh, disciplines and uh, create the necessary uh, framework yourself. When the right, with the right scaling, efficiency is increased. That's an important statement. I mean, there is a big lever. I have just currently a project uh, where we look into test. And when we do analysis of test cases, we typically find that uh, at least half of the test cases uh, in any environment have no big reasoning behind. Uh, that can be insufficient traceability, insufficient coverage criteria, insufficient um, understanding why this test case would be important. And on this basis, we can, of course, go uh, through all these uh, different topics. With the right scaling, efficiency is increased systematically, significantly, that we can now state. And the biggest challenge in managing the change for sustainable is um, we need a sustainable agile organization. We need a sustainable agile culture. And that, again, is a real challenge, as we see in many projects, that, as I said, I mean, agile cannot just be by tailoring a framework. It means building the culture, going away from ping pong, as we see often between teams, into a real ownership, ensuring that you have the necessary competencies, understanding what's the definition of done. I see HR projects which deliver work products like requirements and other artifacts in a lousy quality. And you ask yourself, did they never agree what about the definition of done, which is a key HR principle? And that is what I mean. I mean, we see so many projects, change projects, transformation projects, which claim they introduce agility, but in fact would not uh, do that as uh, it is not sustainable. And with that, I would like also to invite you for an exchange of um, some more information. We have a yearly event, which is in the meantime in the new normal also entirely remote, uh, you can already plan the date, uh, 24 June next year. Uh, the previous one was uh, this year, 26 of June, so it was the last Thursday in June. And um, this Vector Forum um, is also uh, accessible in case you want to see uh, some videos. It's on www.vector.com, stay competitive. And we portray or we showcase uh, typical customer projects from different uh, industries, from different segments. And what we can see in this um, setup is that they all have changed a lot, be it in terms of how do I work in international teams, how do or distributed national teams, how do I run uh, a pipeline for HL, uh, continuous X, um, etc. So there's a good level of understanding in the meantime industry that agility is as I also pointed out, something you have to really drive yourself in your company and not rely rely on um, a scaling tool which claims that they address all purpose because while it is theoretically possible, uh, the complexity of such models um, would be overwhelming. I hear that from customers. I have customers, um, big companies, uh, Fortune 100 companies who would say, um, I used this framework X, Y, Z, and it just didn't work. Why? Because they thought just by a management decision to use such a framework, it would be suitable. 
sometimes also because they never really spend enough energy to introduce the framework or train the people. But there can be many such reasons. And for that reason, it's also good to occasionally benchmark, look what is available. And this is why I recommend also this um, uh, sample here with uh, our Vector Forum 2020 with the videos. And with um, there's also a, a nice white paper out there, which you can also download. And, and then learn from uh, the best. I think that's always what we have to uh, to do, have to continuously do. And that brings me to the end of this uh, overview on HR scaling. In a nutshell, to summarize, I started out with challenges, which we see in the current industry. I emphasize that it started already before COVID. When we look backwards in 2019, a couple of industries were already in, in, in trouble. And therefore, the picture with short-term focus on cost, on quality, on competences, is not something which came overnight. And with COVID, it was already there before. What has been accelerated by COVID is what we call this new normal, that we suddenly realize that we cannot continue as before. We need more home office. We need less traveling. But we also realize it gives us less friction and it gives us possibilities to work in a better way. And with this starting point, I move then into what does it mean for agile? And I translated it for the four typical change dimension, which is that you need to apply agile your business model, this is, I guess, the most obvious, but also to technology, to process, to people, and understand what it means to take them along such a journey. You need to do that with a lot of change agents, eventualists from inside the company. I'm a consultant, but I also tell my customer continuously, don't rely only on the consultants. Make sure you work with a consultant always with the target that you get self-reliant over time. And this is my ambition in this business, and that's the only possibility to really achieve a sustainability because uh, anything else means that they depend on, uh, on the consultant, and this is not exactly a, a viable solution. Then we have looked into how can we rate agile competence along the five level, which I mentioned, that shows also the culture change. We use that grid very much for culture changes. And on this basis, we then looked into what are the frameworks and major frameworks which are currently available and what is the rating. And we realized that none of these ready-made uh, frameworks really has a perfect fit. And as I mentioned repeatedly, many give it up. You have seen the figures, one-third successful, two-third failures, up from 50-50 still some 10 years ago. And a final uh, topic was that I showed a couple of industry uh, case studies, one from IT, one from automotive, and uh, showed also that the whole change, of course, depends on the goals, but then also means that we bring the different uh, Lego pieces in the right order, we make a change roadmap, and in doing so, then also deliver a sustainable value. With that being said, we arrive at the end of this webinar, which um, each time, I think I do it now, the third time or so, uh, is a rather updated content. Uh, I mean, this year we are in the year of uh, COVID, it changed a lot of things, but it also shows that in order to be successful in a new normal, we need HR, we need HR scaling. And so I thank you very much for listening to this overview, and I hand it back now for the Q&A session. Great. Thanks so much. We do have a few questions. Um, first being, how are the agile methodologies seen in general purpose products different from that of critical engineering? How are the Agile methodologies seen in general purpose products different from that of critical engineering? Yes. 
Uh, it's a good point because, I mean, uh, from some distance, uh, we always have the same underlying uh, five elements of agility. This was this wheel with which I was showing, which uh, has uh, empowerment, which has value orientation, which has um, reduction of waste, which has the value stream, and which has continuous learning. Um, this was something which I learned um, at the beginning of my uh, professional career when I did the first Agile projects. At that time, I introduced feature-driven development in an organization with uh, 6,000 engineers. And I realized that it was long before we talked about scaling in critical system. I was growing up in IT, so I know that world very well in general purpose. We need empowerment. Uh, that means feature-driven development helped us to uh, have um, teams which have a necessary competence set in order to drive uh, their own fate, make estimates, plan, and deliver. We need to focus on the value. It's important that the people understand what is their value contribution. That means, for instance, uh, excellent traceability. It's also something which has nothing to do with critical products. It applies to all. Uh, often, even today, the starting point of our transformation projects is traceability. I mean, here are customer requirements, here are system requirements, here are um, implementation. People who work only in implementation, which is normal in design or would later on test, and would not have a connection to the customer value and the needs, will fail. So again, here is a key principle, value orientation, which uh, you have to translate into the different products, but which is not at all primarily driven by the need of um, having a, any kind of um, high liability. Number three, which is reduced waste, is also a very classic one. When I started out, uh, one of the KPI which I was always looking is uh, what is customer feedback and what are the field defects. I mean, in telecommunication, ICT, uh, this is a classic. You want to you have only so and so much downturn per year. You look into customer feedback, etc., and this is service orientation. And again, it means when we see something lagging along the life cycle, we have to improve it, reduce waste, always think twice before you ship something which is insufficient. I mentioned earlier the need for a DOD, a definition of done. Again, this is a principle which is ignorant. Is it critical or is it general purpose? And we move on to number four, which is uh, that we uh, focus on the value stream. Have as few as possible uh, change uh, or let's say handover points between different disciplines. That is a key principle, not nothing to do with uh, the, the critical systems. And finally, continuously improve. I think that's a no-brainer. In other words, I showed showcases deliberately not only automotive, which is safety critical. I also showed a second showcase, which was IT, because IT was the first half of my professional life. I still have many IT customers in finance and others to know the language, but also the needs. And uh, what I really uh, emphasize here is that is sometimes disturbing uh, in the IT world. I deliberately speak about software engineering. And why I do that is simply speaking because we need to have an engineering perspective, which is a disciplined, systematic, measurable way of working. That's what I tell my students, because often if they come from computer science, they have not this background. And it's, it has to be systematic, it has to be measurable, it has to be disciplined. And this engineering approach, this guides us independent of what is the product. That was a quite long answer, but I think it was an excellent question. I don't want now to just uh, sell a strategy for safety critical uh, HR projects. Uh, what I do or what we do is that we apply it to all sort of um, projects in different industries. Great. Thank you. And how do we track the work products in Agile, in the Agile way of working? There is incremental development and software is rolling out continuously. So are there any ways to track the completion of the Agile work products? I'm not fully sure I get this question. Um, what I 
Yeah, maybe I really have to guess first. So is the intention just to read, how do we track or what, what is the, the question behind? Um, how do we track the work products in the, in Agile since there is incremental development okay. in software? Okay. Good. Yeah, this is what I understood, but I just wanted to be sure not that I give an answer and I don't fail. Um, I mentioned already one important, um, a tracking um, need is uh, what we call the definition of done, and that's also the one which is mostly missing. If you write a test case, just to tag another example and only code and um, a requirement, if you prepare a test case, think about what is the marginal value of this test case. A definition of done of a test case is not that it later on runs without finding a defect. This is an entirely wrong attitude. A good definition of done is if a test case has the potential to identify a defect and be as much as possible linear independent of other test cases. And this is measured by coverage. This is measured by maybe a traceability to requirements. This is also why we speak about test-oriented requirements engineering, that a test case on the high level of the um, abstraction would uh, somehow relate to requirements. On a low level, we have test-driven development. In other words, this definition of done allows trace, allows us to track the progress. And HI progress tracking is a binary approach. It's done or it's not done. And that I think was one of the biggest advantages of HI. If I look backwards the past 20 years, when I started, a big worry was always that people were speaking about we're almost done. And, and you never knew really what do they mean with almost done. And uh, there's this saying, uh, which we call the 90% complete syndrome, uh, that 90% of the time people say we are 90% complete. They start coding and after a week they say, oh, we're almost done. And a year later they say, oh, I'm almost done. <laughs> and this is nuts. I mean, this will not help. So I definitely support that we need a binary decision on results. We say it's done or it's not done, and not 80% done. And done means, for instance, that a requirement is implemented and is tested, is ready to deliver. That means we need Agile, but Agile works only if from the beginning we split our requirements in a way that we can stepwise increase the amount of requirements which are implemented and tested. As long as this is not done, it's not available, we, we cannot really track HR progress. And this is a failure I see in many companies that they have this pseudo incremental approach. It looks nice on the paper, but because of the complexity, they are still in a almost big bang situation. So it's HR waterfall, or as you want to call it. They behave HR, but still don't really achieve it. And this is why in this uh, crit with the five agile levels, I distinguish very clearly, do they have an agile culture or do they only have an agile uh, painting? That means they use words like Scrum and uh, Kanban, but still somehow are surprised that things cannot be integrated after they have been coded. And this, approach is certainly not what we need in terms of tracking progress. Great. Thanks so much. And is there any drawback of Agile or limitations um, that we must need to focus upon or keep in mind before transforming into Agile frameworks? Yeah, I guess I put a couple of risks on the table. I think a big risk which we often see is the insufficient understanding that Agile is a real culture change. It's a transformation. It's not something which you get out of the book. That was also the second risk, and, and I, I emphasize this very much. Don't even assume there is a solution which comes out of the book. I agree Agile in the small, that's possible out of the book. Uh, a Scrum, and Scrum is really one of the methods which I like very much. Um, to make a clear statement about what you do during the day, commitment, as we say, and in the evening you finish when you have really delivered according to that commitment. This is a very smart approach. And 
anything beyond which is scrum of scrum which is less which is safe and all these frameworks um they have always the challenge which we had uh, years ago already with uh, process frameworks like cmmi which initially also were very nice but over time they grew and grew and grew and became complex and complex and complex and that's now the same with these agile frameworks and that's why customer realize it's not any more viable because uh, all this tailoring doesn't work. And if they cannot apply the framework, you would not really call it a helpful uh, approach. And I've seen so many uh, users of one of these framework who were somewhere st stuck in transformation. This is as I quoted initially from this uh, McKinsey figures. So certainly uh, McKinsey is not the one company which is introducing HR. So and assume that these numbers are rather um, reliable because uh, they have a rather big base of industry contacts. 25% are lost in this transition process because they never really achieve to get it fully implemented. This is risk number two. And beyond that, there are many smaller risks like the questions earlier and no definition of done insufficient test strategy, insufficient team set up. Um, there are many of these, and of course, they can all be repaired. I, for instance, currently a project uh, which uh, spreads across a couple of regions, and they made one of these mistakes, which I saw 20 years ago, I see it today, which is uh, to, to throw something over the fence. Uh, so this company has a development center in India, and they try to put a process in place where India would do unit tests. And I recall 15 years ago, I had a telecom uh, customer, uh, which, or not customer, was a, a company, company with which we worked, a supplier. They had the same defect. They thought, let's do unit tests uh, and uh, parts of integration and some security testing in India. Now, this will not scale because people need to have ownership, and ownership is on the level of requirements and feature being developed, not on a level of a task. And as long as we outsource fine granular task, we cannot call it agile. That is not something which will scale, independent which model you are using. So. It's always a package with a value which you can uh, put in a given location. So that's what I mean. I mean, there are many, many risks which relate to agile transformation, but certainly they can be mitigated. Great. Thanks so much. And thanks to everyone for your questions. Just a few reminders. The PDU code for today's webinar will be sent to you via email. And if you would like to become a premium member of the Great IT Professional, you can visit our subscribe page at greatpro.org slash subscribe. Premium membership is $1.99 per year. It does allow you unlimited anytime access to the online library, which includes 1,000 PDU hours. You can try out our mobile app, as I mentioned earlier, at greatpro.org slash mobile. So now uh, Christoph's email is on the screen, so please feel free to reach out to him if you do think of additional questions later today or you'd like more information. Christoph.ebert at vector.com. If you have questions on the great IT professional, I can be reached at wendy.nolan at cei.io. So thanks again to everyone for joining, and thanks so much to you, Christoph, for being here, for sharing your time and knowledge. Sure. It was my pleasure. Great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, and stay well.